Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about Rust lifetimes. Uh, if you're a Rust beginner, you may have already run into these. They're pretty tricky. Maybe you haven't ran into them yet. They might be tricky. If you're a more experienced Rust programmer, you've probably seen this, and you've probably learned how to fix lifetime errors when they come up in your code. But I still want to come back to what looks more like a beginner example and really think through the code the way the compiler sees it and talk more clearly about why we fix the code the way we do and what we're telling the compiler when we do that. And if you're a very experienced Rust programmer, you know, this may already be familiar to you, but I also want to think a little bit about how we teach this stuff because I think it's very interesting and it's definitely very important. So I'm going to try to teach it a slightly different way. I am recording this talk twice. So this is the second recording. This is the fast version. So I've already recorded the slow version. It's about half an hour long. This version I expect to be less than 15 minutes. We're going to go a lot faster. I'm going to assume a little more background knowledge about, for example, I'm going to assume that most of what you see on the screen right now is familiar. If not, I'm going to link to the slow version in the description. So go ahead and start there if you like, or switch back and forth if you need, whatever works for you. We're going to go a little fast here. So let's look at this code, right? For those of us who spent some time with Rust, there's not much to this, right? We're creating a string, capital S string. So this string owns its memory, right? We're creating a vec. I've gone ahead and annotated the type of that vec. We don't usually need to do that here in the body of a function, but it'll help us later. Um, we push a reference to the string into the vec, shared reference, right? If you're coming from C++, you know, this is your standard string, this is your standard vector, and this is your const pointer or const reference, right? Shared reference in Rust. And then we print it, right? Debug print, not going to worry too much about the syntax here. It's probably familiar to a lot of people. Let's run it, right? Not too exciting, right? Great. We print the vec. It's got a string in it. So as you can tell from the comments here, uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start breaking this, right? Let's break this. So I uncomment the drop for C++ folks that's saying run the destructor here. Effectively, we're destroying the string. Normally it would go out of scope here on line 11. Instead, it's going to go out of scope on line nine now. And we should not expect that to be okay, right? So we are, we, we, we still have a reference to the string in the VEC. We're still printing that. So if we destroy the string here, that's a use after free or something, right? Uh, depending on our language background, we might see it differently. Rust does not have a garbage collector. It is not going to keep the string alive after we drop it. And so this should not compile, and it doesn't compile in Rust. We can see that very quickly. So most folks with some Rust experience have certainly seen something like this. Rust is going to call this drop. Rust is going to call that a move. We're moving the string by value into drop. Fair enough. This, uh, this reference or this pointer here, Russ is going to call that a borrow. It's going to call that lifetime relationship, with the string and the vec, a borrow. Fair enough. So the vec has borrowed the string. This line sort of establishes that. And we're clearly using the vec and the borrow inside of it down here. So we cannot destroy the string here. Fair enough. This is, I want to say, this is a lifetime error. Now, it, now, it's happening in the body of the function, right? So we haven't had to really say anything about lifetimes uh, for this to work when we don't destroy the string. This works fine without saying anything about the lifetimes. As with regular types of our data, right? Rust within the body of a function generally figures stuff out for us. Not always, generally. And we don't have to talk too much about it. But... You can see where my comment is going here. As we start factoring things out into separate functions, we start writing the signatures of those functions. We have to talk about it. That's true of the types of our function arguments. And that's in some cases, in this case, true of the lifetimes. Let's go ahead and uncomment this. So I'm going to try to factor out this line into a separate function that pushes a reference to a string into a vector. Let's go ahead and call that my push. Now I need an explicit mutable reference to the vector. Previously, the dot was doing that automatically. And my string. Fair enough. So this code really looks like it's doing the same thing. Those of us who've written this sort of thing before know it's not going to work. And that's really what we're here to talk about. Let's run it. Doesn't work. So if you're seeing this for the first time, this looks pretty weird. 
right? We can see some hints here. And yes, this is ultimately what we're going to do. We'll get there. But I want to get there in a slightly different way than usual. Uh, if this is the first time you're seeing it, yep, this looks weird. This looks weird. So one more thing I want to do here before we move on into some experiments is I want to make it clear that this error that we're getting, it's, it's really in, it's just in this function, right? It doesn't really have anything to do with how the function is called. If we, if we look back here, the error was on lines one and two and, and one again. Um, we can comment out the entire body of main and it doesn't make a difference. It's the same error, right? So this error is really just this function by itself. Rust is not happy with how the signature of this function has described what it's going to do. And when, and when Rust does look at the body, it says, mm, you didn't ask for the permission you need to do this. And this lifetime stuff is going to be about asking for that. So keep that in mind. Let's do something a little weird. I'm going to put my main function back the way it was. And instead of jumping right into lifetimes to fix this code, I want to do something that feels a little more complicated, but it turns out it's easier to get it working. I want to make this generic. So if we want my push to work with any vec element type T, then we can go ahead and define a type parameter T. C++ folks will find that pretty familiar. And if the vec contains T, then that, this must also be a T. So if we do this, it kind of feels like we're getting farther away from the solution. But surprisingly, if I run this code, it works. Isn't that interesting? So going back to the code, by telling the compiler, well, it seems like we're telling the compiler less about these types here. We're not saying anything about how it's a string or ref to a string, which it is when we get down to the caller. It feels like we've told the compiler less. It turns out we've told the compiler a little more in one very specific way, which is that we've told the compiler that these two types are exactly the same. By giving them the same name, we've told the compiler that they're the same. And it turns out that that's all the compiler needs to see how this is working. It needs to know that these are the same type. So this lifetime stuff, yeah, we're going to get to it. We're going to write them all out. But we can imagine that this lifetime stuff, wherever it comes from, <laughs> winds up going through the types. It's in here. Right? This T could be anything, and in our case, it is a ref string, and it has a lifetime. It's all packed in there somehow in the compiler's eyes. Here's an interesting thing to notice before we move on from this. It doesn't matter what we do in the body. So, well, it does matter. If I, if I don't push here, then of course, foo will not be in the vec because I didn't push it, and I get some unused variable warnings. But here's something interesting. Can I drop the string? No. So you'd think by not pushing the string into the vec, I, I have made it OK to, dr to drop it. And in our minds, it's true, I have. In the compiler's view, I have not. So the compiler is really only looking at this signature here when it's, look, when it's trying to figure out whether the main function is legal. So it sees the same lifetime relationship here as as I really established when I did the push, the compiler isn't looking to see whether I actually do the push on the inside. It's just the types. That's all the compiler is seeing here. So if, last note on this, this sort of silly version of the story, if I did want the caller to be able to drop my string here, then I would need to tell the compiler that these are not the same type. I can do that. So if I add a second type parameter, T and U, those are the traditional names, make this a U, then let me go ahead and comment this out at first. Now I have not told the compiler that these are the same, so no borrowing relationship is established here, and this drop is legal. Let's see it happen. Yep, still got some warnings, but the code ran, right? We did not push into the VEC. And of course, now we cannot push into the VEC, right? If I try to do this, we can see this is not going to work, right? I'm trying to take a U and push it into a vec of T. Those are just different, right? Of course, it's not going to work, and it doesn't, right? I can see exactly the error we expect there, right? Type mismatch, right? Those aren't the same. So when we do it this way, 
it's pretty obvious that this wasn't going to, this isn't, isn't going to work. This doesn't feel mysterious, I think, if, we, if we've seen these generics before. Now let's take that intuition and come back to lifetimes. So I will make this a ref string again, and this one too. And for now, I will delete these type parameters. And let's put the code back in to the version that should work. Uh, we're not destroying the string, but we remember it doesn't work, right? And we run it and we see the error we saw before. Something, something lifetimes. But now we have this tool in our toolbox, right? We might guess that even though the compiler is talking about this error very differently, the nature of the error is the same. We're trying to push one of these into one of these and the compiler does not see that those are the same type. They're not the same type. It looks like they're the same type. They certainly type them out the same way. Well, it turns out, and this is lifetimes, right? Turns out there are invisible parameters here. These types are incomplete. We've left some stuff out. There are rules for this. I'm going to mention the docs briefly. I have them up in my browser. Uh, this is the lifetime elision rules. Here's the book talking about it. Here's the reference talking about it. I'll link to these in the description. Um, and we can read the first rule, right? Each elided lifetime, elided means left out. Each elided lifetime in the parameters, in the arguments to the function, become a distinct lifetime parameter. They get different names effectively. That's what the compiler is hinting us here. It's starting to give them names that aren't different. That's what we're going to need. Let's go ahead and undo the lifetime elision. Let's write this out. So. There are three lifetimes here. It turns out that there's lifetimes here and here and here. We might have forgotten about this one. Let's write them out. The names don't matter. The tick apostrophe here, that means lifetime, right? Uh, I'm going to call this, I'm going to call this one C. So now we've really written out the types. And I think having seen what we just saw, the problem is super clear, right? Oh yeah, these types are not the same. So because of the lifetime elision rules, we didn't quite see that before, but this is what Rust was seeing. It needs these to be the same. And we can see that the error, I haven't fixed it yet. We can see that the error has morphed a bit since we've given them names, it doesn't make up numbers. This is a little funny, this guy here. We'll talk about that. That's not the fix we're gonna go with. But I think now we know what to do, right? These things need to be the same. Let's make them the same, right? Let's make this A. It's like making both sides T, right? We're going back from that T and U situation back into the T and T situation. These are the same. This is gonna work. No warnings, even. <laughs> Despite the fact that we're, we've declared B and we're not even using it. Turns out that's not a warning. It's kind of funny. Get rid of it. We have C here. Uh, we'll talk more about that in, in just a moment. But for now, we can just say that, hey, we've called this C, but we haven't called anything else C. We haven't said anything about the relationship between C and anything else. So we might as well just not name it. Let's get rid of that. And there we are. And this is probably the code. This is the code that the more experienced Rust programmers might have written. You might make this stir instead of string. It doesn't super duper matter. Uh, but this is pretty similar to what experienced Rust programmers might write. This is pretty similar to what the compiler was hinting us at the beginning. This is the lifetime parameter. But instead of being sort of mystery meat <laughs> syntax that we just throw in there, I think now we can see what we've done, right? We've said that these are the same. And the same rules still apply, right? So if I don't do the push, you know what? That's okay. That doesn't really matter. The compiler still believes that this drop is illegal, right? Because once again, it's reasoning from the function signatures. It knows we can't drop it. Well, it thinks we can't drop this because it's behaving as though they are lifetime related. So before we finish up here, I do want to mention a common mistake that folks can make. You may have made this mistake yourself as we're getting used to lifetimes and adding them in. Sometimes we add them in too many places. For example, we might make the mistake of calling this A, right? Maybe we just try our luck 
It turns out we don't want to do that, right? So this, this mutable reference to the VEC needs to be short-lived. It needs to be short-lived because there's a no mutable aliasing rule in Rust, right? Mutable references cannot alias any other reference. And we're going to need another reference to the VEC when we get down here and try to print it. That's going to take a shared reference implicitly. And so if we've said that the mutable reference, even though it's not the same type, it's a reference to a VEC, not the same as a reference to a string, but in this case, we've made a mistake and we've said that it lives as long as the reference to the string, which lives as long as the contents of the VEC, basically saying this mutable reference to the VEC lives as long as the VEC itself, then this borrow is going to last all the way to end of scope. And we're gonna have an issue here. We can see that. Right. So cannot borrow my VEC as immutable because it is also borrowed as mutable. This is pretty surprising when you run into it by accident because this was not our intent, right? It doesn't make sense for this to live that long, but we accidentally told Rust that, that it does. So something to watch out for, you will get used to this. But here we are, right? Now we've told the type system exactly what it needs to know. These are the same type. Rust is representing lifetime information in the types. Uh, the type system is doing a little more work than we're used to. And in function signatures, when the lifetime elision rules don't apply, we do have to be explicit about that. Some notes before we close for completeness. We did see that uh, that hint the compiler was giving us. I'll put this back. I think when we called this B and this was B, the compiler gave us an interesting hint. Let's get that back, right? The compiler told us something about this syntax. The compiler didn't necessarily say where to put it. it. It turns out there's more than one place to put it. We read this as B outlives A. This is a thing you can do. I'm just gonna say you're not gonna need this, right? Not, not for your first year or two, not until you start writing library code that's doing some pretty fancy things. So you might see this, it's an outlives relation. You can read about it in Rust by example or in the, uh, the Rust Nomicon. I will, I will link to those things. We're not gonna need it. Right. When you're learning this stuff, it's really enough to just be able to say that two things are the same. Let's go back to saying that. Right. These two things are the same. Last thing for completeness, there are cases where a long-lived thing is used in a place that wants a short-lived thing. Rust calls this variance. If you read the Rust Nomicon, you will see it, you will learn it. We don't need it. So be aware that there are interesting and wonderful mysteries in the future, we'll all get there. <laughs> and for now, I think we've seen enough of the type system, not just to fix the code, but to feel like we understand why it works. I hope. Thanks for listening.